Hi, everyone. I want to thank you all for joining us on today's webinar on the topic of understanding the acute and persistent nature of bipolar disorder. Today's webinar features Dr. Manpreet Singh. Dr. Singh is an Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University and leads a research program aimed to accelerate understanding and treatment in individuals with or at high risk for developing bipolar disorder. She is also investigating the efficacy and safety of existing pharmacotherapies and psychotherapies for youth with and at risk for bipolar disorder, such as antidepressants, family-focused psychotherapy, and mindfulness meditation to reduce mood symptoms and family stress. There will also be a 15-minute question and answer session at the end of the webinar, so have your questions ready. And with all that being said, I'm proud to introduce our panelist, Dr. Manpreet Singh. Thank you so much, Jake, and the International Bipolar Foundation for this kind invitation. I'm super excited to be here today and to share my um, understanding and experience and what I've learned over the last 16 years or so, almost 20 in fact, um, working with um, individuals with and at risk for bipolar disorder. Here are my disclosures of potential conflicts. I do collaborate with a number of industry partners and may talk about some off-label innovations that are on the horizon, um, hopefully to cultivate hope um, about some novel treatments um, in the pipeline. Um, we need some perhaps uh, alternative ways of thinking about how to understand bipolar disorder and what, as well as how to treat it. And so I'm really excited about sharing some of those innovations with you today as well. So my hope today is to review for a few minutes the current ways we diagnose and treat bipolar disorder, describe some challenges that we've experienced um, that sometimes create some barriers to early treatment engagement, response, and prevention. Um, my hope is to integrate an ev uh, evidence-based approaches into discussions of how we can maybe even prevent um, bipolar disorder from fully being realized in individuals and also provide some uh, prevention strategies for people who are already living with the condition um, in terms of continuity of care over the lifespan. And finally, I'll conclude with some innovation, uh, um, sharing of some innovations that are on the horizon, mostly to cultivate hope that there are some new strategies um, that uh, we can maybe consider that are different from what we've already had in play over the last many years. So we all know that bipolar disorder is a lifelong condition. And for most adults who experience this disorder, they report that the onset most commonly occurs in adolescence. The condition is chronic and persistent. And in fact, if you have a young age of onset or early onset, it's often associated with poor long-term prognosis and increased risk for suicide compared to an adult onset. Bipolar disorder is increasingly being recognized in children and adolescents and um, across the lifespan, people are understanding this condition more and diagnosing it better. We're screening for it better because we have now a number of tools to be able to both screen for the diagnosis and make that diagnosis. Bipolar disorder is also complex. It runs with a number of other conditions. It's episodic, so it comes and goes. So that can make it sometimes very difficult to make an accurate diagnosis. It's also multidimensional. And so that can also complicate how we make an effective diagnosis. The good news though, is that symptoms um, associated with bipolar disorder can be managed. We have solid evidence for both the acute management of symptoms and some knowledge of how we can help prevent recurrent episodes. But what about for what happens later down the line or as you continue to have persistent mood episodes, how can you live your best life? These are areas um, that are, remain open questions for us to understand and to optimize the treatment of bipolar disorder across the lifespan. Finally, it's also very interesting and intriguing that we could potentially prevent bipolar disorder if we identify early symptoms or understand risk populations. And with the advent of risk calculators and other tools, um, including neuroimaging and genetics, uh, we've been able to be a bit more granular as to understanding why this condition occurs for some people and why some people are able to avoid it even with certain risk factors. 
at the end of the day, if we can predict it, can we potentially prevent it from a beginning or even continuing um, over the course of the life? Certainly we have some challenges to attend to um, before we think um, uh, about preventing bipolar disorder completely. Uh, most individuals we know um, who live with bipolar disorder often don't achieve full remission even after prolonged treatment. Seems like it follows a natural rule of threes or one third people get better, one third people stay about the same and one third people potentially get worse. It seems like depressive symptoms predict um, more time being ill and manic symptoms predict um, hospital admissions. Certainly adding psychotherapies like CBT and other CBT likes treatments like family focused therapy and interpersonal rhythm therapies especially among youth um, who really could benefit from um, these non-invasive uh, first-line interventions can be very helpful, especially if there's suicidal ideation to re prevent recurrent episodes. But the widespread dissemination of these evidence-based therapies has been limited. The hope is that maybe with telehealth and our ability to now use um, a variety of different technology tools, maybe we can do a better job with dissemination. Bipolar disorder presents differently in different people. It's cl clinically heterogeneous. Some people have one lifetime manic episode while others experience many lifetime manic episodes. What are those differences about and how can we understand how to in interact with those differences in terms of treatment planning? It's also true that the long-term course and the effects of untreated mood symptoms either and, and their treatment for that matter are either unknown or hotly debated. For example, there's some recent meta-analyses that suggest and that, um, that bipolar disorder may not be a neurodegenerative condition as there it's not clear from existing um, uh, review of um, cognitive uh, studies that um, people experience any um, long-term degenerative effects or that, um, that it's, it's the case that bipolar disorder is um, a, a progressive cognitively deteriorating condition because most individuals with bipolar disorder don't seem to be experiencing those cognitive deteriorations as it's suggested or intuited um, in, in, in what we see in clinical practice. We have more work to do to address the longitudinal course uh, of cognition as well as other major aspects that impact day-to-day -day functioning of individuals who live with bipolar disorder and better identify which subgroups are more prone to those kinds of degeneration um, uh, effects versus those that respond quite well uh, to treatments and, and remain well for the remainder of their lives. Finally, people with bipolar disorder may live with the, this very unusual or interesting uh, juxtaposition, if you will, of mania and depression happening simultaneously or in rapid cycling shifts. It's commonly reported particularly among youth, so younger brains um, and earlier stages of development. You see a little bit more of this diagnostically undifferentiated aspect of bipolar disorder, um, but this, these mixed features are now being thought of or conceptualized potentially as emotion dysregulation, which certainly may be a component of it, um, or a disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, um, which often tends to evolve to major depression rather than bipolar disorder. So it becomes very confusing to understand how these phenotypes emerge early in childhood and whether they evolve into uh, a bipolar disorder or something else. So we have some more work to do to characterize these phenotypes and also understand how they track over time. When we think about treatment approaches for bipolar disorder, we've envisioned them to um, match the commonly reported childhood or adolescent onset. And we take the approach that mood disorders can present variably over time. They benefit from psychosocial and psychoeducational interventions first, and then added uh, over time um, with medication interventions. We realize that comorbidity is a rule rather than the exception. And we want to try our best to try one medication at a time if we can. 
um, and where we may experience that some complex symptoms need more than one medication and how do we understand um, the dynamics and interactions of those um, multiple medications. We try to assess and manage side effects because we know that our current treatments um, are associated with some side effects. And if we can reduce the dose or re-challenge with a different medication, that sequence can be much better than to try multiple things at once, which can be very confusing to understand what's actually helping versus hurting the situation. We also know that limited response rates may be related to a variety of different things. Kids are more prone to side effects, so age can be an independent risk factor for having side effects, regardless of the disease condition. We also know that kids who are difficult to treat and adults who are difficult to treat tend to report more side effects, so how do we understand treatment failures in that context? Bipolar disorder doesn't happen in isolation, so treating the individual may have limited effects. It's very important to understand that this condition benefits from a systems-based approach where we help the patient, but also help the situation or environment they're in as well by um, helping them manage around negative and stressful life events, understand the circumstances that trigger mania or depressive symptoms, uh, address family conflict in the family system. This all leads to somewhat of a trial and error approach to get to remission, and that can sometimes diminish trust among patients and families and also reduce motivation to engage in treatment. So we have some work to do to really ensure that we have the right relationship, the kind of therapeutic relationship that over the long term benefits the patient. Um, as I mentioned before, depression symptoms tend to be mainstay um, challenge for individuals who live with this condition. Mania symptoms might land you in the hospital, but it is important for us to understand the different effects of different episodes over the course of um, bipolar disorder across the lifespan. So with all of these current um, understandings, I think that it's not unreasonable for us to um, imagine that we may need a variety of different breakthroughs um, in order to prevent bipolar disorder from lasting a lifetime. First of all, I think it's very helpful for us to think about primary prevention strategies. And so a number of folks are thinking deeply about diagnostic markers or biomarkers that can help us detect the condition early. Secondary prevention involves um, preemptive interventions for those who are at risk or in pre-symptomatic stages to help uh, reduce the early symptoms that may not quite meet threshold criteria for bipolar disorder, but try to curb the problems that are associated with bipolar disorder over the lifespan as early as possible. And then those finally who are living with bipolar disorder, it's helpful for us to um, innovate on better treatments for people living with it. And that not only are um, important in terms of their own perspectives of what matters to them from a perspective of interpersonal functioning, social functioning, functioning in the work environment or at school, but then also track with their outcomes. So one, so we can um, envision how we can predict not just symptoms, but also treatment response, then we can better understand what tracks with outcome. So I consider this a very useful roadmap. In fact, it's how I've oriented my research over the last um, many years to help me think about the long-term course of bipolar disorder. We understand that it comes in, uh, what do we say about, um, um, you know, April showers bring May flowers, some, some months come in like a lion and out like a lamb, right? Um, it almost feels like bipolar disorder comes in like a lion. Um, and then the long term course is very variable across um, individuals. So how can we understand um, what predisposes people to have rough uh, a course versus a, a more stable one in the long term? Certainly there's a balance of factors that contribute. And um, in my work, we've realized that um, there are a number of factors that contribute to adaptive outcomes versus more recurrent episodes. Um, these may be related to what's going on in the environment, 
um, actually having symptoms recurrently, like depressive symptoms predicting a worsening course, or mania symptoms predicting hospitalizations, or genetic predisposition. We understand there's inflammatory contributions to the development of bipolar disorder and its recurrence. And that, you know, it's also true that people, when they engage in treatment um, and, and remain in treatment, actually may be able to set themselves up for more an adaptive course. Those interventions mitigate uh, relapse and recurrence. And that the brain is also wired to adapt and to be um, uh, uh, predisposed to resilience or protect the brain from recurrent episodes. And so what are the compensatory mechanisms at play in the brain that can help us understand what poises people for success? We'll start first with primary prevention and what kinds of um, information we can learn from that. I suggested that primary prevention um, might be oriented around discovering biomarkers for early detection. When we've realized that children um, may not be many adults and that there may be some hot debates about whether kids can have bipolar disorder, we're not going to spend too much time on that debate today. But we do understand that early manifestations of bipolar disorder might not present quite like they do in adults, but that classic mania most commonly presents in adolescence and young adulthood. Preceding that, there are a number of um, factors, what we call prodromal symptoms that might contribute or track. So in the kids that present to me who, for example, um, come to college um, presenting with a first break manic episode, will they'll describe their um, adolescence with a variety of different um, symptoms and behaviors um, that um, might have kind of created a, a somewhat of a, a track towards mania. And cer certainly kids perform very well at school um, when, um, when they experience hypomania symptoms so well that they might land in very prestigious universities. Um, but they might be experiencing levels of energy and, um, and, and function uh, and capacity and, and confidence. Um, they might be predisposed to be more impulsive, um, engage in recreational uh, drug use, um, or uh, might um, uh, go on spending sprees. Um, these are the kinds of early clues that help us understand, even from a retrospective report of an, a college student who can, who can basically describe the writing on the wall. Um, of course, hindsight is 2020, but you know, in, as we realize that there are many things in um, childhood that don't necessarily um, help us uh, set people up for success, these diagnostic orphan, orphans and multiple comorbid morbidities, um, we can maybe look at um, youth who might have, for example, a family history of bipolar disorder. And how can we understand who goes on to develop bipolar disorder and who doesn't, and what are the characteristics of those youth um, based on a family history. And what we found in our studies of patients um, at familial risk for bipolar disorder is that um, there may actually be some early signs in the brain that may predispose towards vulnerability, but also may protect the brain from developing bipolar disorder. Here are my kids on any given day. They're charming very lovable towards one another. And then on other days, they're literally at each other's throats. We use family history of bipolar disorder as our model system because it's hard very often to tease apart what's normal development or typical uh, versus something that may be more ad maladaptive. And when we did early studies in healthy offspring of parents with bipolar disorder who didn't have any um, uh, symptoms of any mania or depression or even ADHD or anxiety, no prodromal symptoms whatsoever, those kids interestingly showed different brain characteristics in kids that, who did not have a family history of any psychiatric conditions. When we compared those youth um, and, uh, in their brain circuits, we found patterns, for example, of um, more uh, disconnected networks that I'll show you in a moment, and also that those disconnected um, networks corresponded to more chaotic family environments. So this led us to do more work um, with neuroimaging to see if we could understand what we could learn about the brain, the developing brain in the context of a bipolar family risk. 
we expanded our um, learnings too to depression because um, depression is the most common first episode that people with bipolar disorder may experience. And so could we delineate bipolar disorder from a unipolar depression um, using the brain? And in, in, indeed, in the brain, we discovered that you can actually tell the difference between someone who's walking around with a risk for a mood disorder versus actually experiencing symptoms. The networks already look like they're evolving and changing with the presence of depressive symptoms. The architecture of certain limbic regions in the brain, certain regions of the brain that are really important for emotion processing and reward processing, are, um, and even networks that are just plainly hanging out at rest show different organizations. And what we'll see here is that even advanced um, graph theory uh, strategies can help us understand the organization of the brain at a very, very fine level. This, uh, this particular tool has been used to understand um, disconnected networks in schizophrenia and also map on to um, understanding the disorganization of the brain in the context of uh, family risk for bipolar disorder. And here, what you see, if you look at um, the comparison of high-risk youth with bipolar, of parents with bipolar disorder who already have some symptoms and compare them to healthy controls, network organizations suggest that kids um, who are healthy have stronger default mode network um, connectivities. Their brains are already able to do good self-referential thinking. That as a consequence, they don't ruminate as much. They don't have low self-esteem compared to high-risk youth who have a family history of bipolar disorder and are already experiencing some depression and anxiety symptoms. Um, in contrast, the kids who are at risk maybe show more predominant um, Connecto, um, connectomes um, in the visual cortex when you present them with uh, um, stimuli um, that look very stressful their brains go into attention visual attention mode and and they're really focused on those emotional symptoms um, uh, and, and emotional pictures um, and potentially get moved by them in terms of how their networks are organized so with real granularity we can really use brain imaging to help us understand risk for bipolar disorder and early manifestations that help us understand that um, that early bi those early biomarkers. So it's also really interesting that the findings we have map on to the things that we've observed in, in adolescents who experience a first episode of mania. Um, my, my now graduated graduate student, um, Dr. Akua Namarka, Namarko um, demonstrated that in, uh, replicated, in fact, um, networks in the brain that are involved in reward processing track similarly with kids who experience a first episode mania. So even high risk youth of parents with bipolar disorder who don't have any symptoms whatsoever show deactivations in the thalamus and decreased connectivity while they're anticipating rewards. The thalamus is critical for um, making connections between areas of the brain that process emotions and areas of the brain that regulate emotions. And it's almost like a, an, a, an interconnection between highways. And when you see impairments in that particular region while you're processing rewards, that's a very important early marker that could um, help us understand how psychopathology evolves. And in fact, other networks of the brain that are important for emotion processing, if, they're in, if they involve a reward region like the putamen um, and the posterior cingulate cortex, which is also important for self-referential thinking, those network deficits predict kids who are going to go on, if you track them over time uh, from a stage of health to developing mood symptoms, the kids who go on to develop some mood symptoms and experience some peer problems have more disconnected networks. What does the family environment um, do to brain networks? Well, replicating some of that earlier work that I described before with more chaotic environments um, uh, correlating with, um, uh, um, with a more disconnected um, uh, limbic and striatal networks in the brain, um, uh, Dr. Adina Fisher from our group also showed that um, lack of connections between the amygdala and the area of the brain that processes face emotions uh, or the fusiform gyrus 
um, and facial expressions, um, that disconnection tracks with more family rigidity. The more rigid the families are, the more the weaker these connections are in high risk youth with bipolar disorder compared to high risk youth who have a parent with depression. In contrast to the weaker connectivity patterns that predict peer problems and ensuing depression and anxiety symptoms, um, what we see, and, and perhaps more chaotic and rigid family environments, we also see brain signatures that seem to track with more adaptive outcomes. So the kids who have a family history of bipolar disorder who seem to have more adaptive outcomes have stronger connections in areas of the brain that are involved in emotion processing and when you track when you follow them over time they seem to show more pro-social behaviors what are pro-social behaviors they are able to make and keep friendships um, down the line those kids are doing well in school and academically functioning likely their cognitive functioning is going um, okay, but most critically, their interpersonal functioning is going well. So this led us to think about what are potential ways that we can help kids have better outcomes by trying to reinforce, if you will, the regions of the brain that are protective. Um, and so what we did is we partnered with Dr. David Miklowitz at UCLA, um, who um, earlier um, helped us think about a family-focused therapy intervention to help treat the system, if you will, to help facilitate, again, more adaptive outcomes. And in our early um, uh, dissemination of family-focused therapy compared to psychoeducation alone, we found a signal that any sort of psychotherapeutic intervention seems to actually improve brain functioning. So this was our initial proof of concept that if you affect the environment, you could actually change the brain um, so that um, that improved functioning could hopefully also lead to other functional outcomes. It goes back to that concept of, are there ways that we can cultivate more pro-social behaviors in kids where kids are making friends and keeping friends and, 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 and able to have more adaptive relationships? In the context of a chaotic family environment, we couldn't think of a better system to help uh, address than the family itself. So we randomized kids to um, who have a bipolar family history, who are experiencing some depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms, maybe some subthreshold mania symptoms, but none of these kids have bipolar disorder. These are kids who experienced uh, what we call prodromal symptoms that look like they might be on the path towards bipolar disorder. Um, and, and we randomized uh, half of them to um, just psychoeducation alone. And then um, uh, also adding pro-social behavior skills training. What are those pro-social skills uh, look like? Well, we help them communicate more effectively in the family system, help them solve problems with their parents and their siblings better in the family environment. So if you take psychoeducation, communication skills and problem solving, you have family-focused therapy. So when you give family-focused therapy to high-risk youth and um, uh, compare that to high-risk youth who just get psychoeducation alone, we watch what happens in a randomized controlled trial. And we found that in the acute phase, just immediately before and immediately after the treatment, both groups did beautifully. They both seemed to respond to um, uh, either intervention uh, uh, in the acute phase, but if you look two or three years out, you see a separation of the two treatment groups where the family-focused therapy group got um, had a different curve, a curve that represented um, reduced relapses of depression. So in other words, family-focused therapy prevented depressive relapse in those youth who got that treatment compared to the kids who just got problem assault, excuse me, psychoeducation alone. When you looked in the brain of these youth, we found that if we did um, uh, pre post brain scans, even though the symptoms seem to improve in both treatment groups, the connectivity patterns actually show differences. 
So where you couldn't see symptom differences in imp symptom improvement in family focused therapy or enhanced care, um, you could see changes in the brain, differences in changes in the brain. The kids who received family focused therapy had more enhanced connections between um, the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex and the anterior aspect of the default mode network. Both regions, very important for emotion processing and emotion regulation and including self-awareness um, and um, self-perception, uh, as well as um, um, reducing rumination uh, uh, um, with depression. So we think that this may be a very interesting neural mechanism of how family-focused therapy might be working in contrast to just providing them with, providing patients with psychoeducation. Interestingly, the kids who got family-focused therapy um, and, and showed this improvement in connectivity patterns also showed reductions in um, depressive symptoms. So the symptom improvement tracked with that increase in connectivity. We also did a number of other tasks in the brain. We had them actually, um, while they were in the MRI scanner, um, conduct an emotion processing task that also showed increased activation in the prefrontal cortex um, while it processing emotions, replicating what we found earlier, but now showing a, a separation from the two treatment groups. And when we, we also had them do a problem solving task in the scanner, we also similarly showed improvements in, in, in functioning in the prefrontal cortex, the area of the brain that's so important for regulation. So we've now come to some understanding that there may be some very important neural mediators of how this depression relapse prevention occurs in kids who are randomized to family-focused therapy. There are also a number of other clinical outcomes that seem to track. The kids who got family-focused therapy had reduced suicidal ideations in subsequent follow-ups, um, along with reduced depression relapse or symptom relapse. What do we do when we see kids who are depressed and anxious who may be at risk for bipolar disorder, but family-focused therapy or another psychotherapeutic intervention doesn't work? What do you do next? For those youth, we think it's very important to not think in the acute phase, but think preventatively long-term, but also wonder what we, can we do in terms of medication management? I mentioned before that kids may not be mini adults. They process medications and interventions differently, perhaps a little bit than adult students. Why we tend to use weight-based and <clears throat> careful and cautious medication titration. And this um, nomogram just shows you that the increase of uh, risk of side effects increases significantly at younger ages. Even if you look at um, under the age of 12, you're almost uh, uh, very likely to have a side effect of some sort if you're exposed to an antidepressant and have a family history of bipolar disorder. So if you can't use family-focused therapy alone, when would you use an antidepressant to treat depression and anxiety? Mind you, none of these kids uh, present with mania symptoms when we're considering it. And if we were, if they were already experiencing mania symptoms, then you would treat the mania symptoms accordingly, but if you just had depression and anxiety, is it safe to use antidepressants? Case reports seem to suggest that young age and family history may be independent risk factors, but there may also be a variety of other neurobiological risk factors that might predispose you to developing side effects from antidepressant exposure. And in fact, some people who live with bipolar disorder experience some of their initial manic episodes in the context of treating depression with antidepressants. So we partnered with the University of Cincinnati to understand uh, this question more granularly and more comprehensively by doing a randomized controlled trial where we gave um, youth who have a bipolar family history but no mania symptoms presenting with depression and anxiety either Lexapro or escitalopram or placebo. All of the kids in this trial for ethical reasons received family-focused therapy as the first line um, evidence-based therapy. And we were looking above that and beyond that some signal for whether or not an antidepressant could help. 
And so far in our preliminary analyses, we, we see that antidepressants don't seem to have much of a different effect than a placebo um, in improving depressive symptoms, where, which is designated here by the CDRS, anxiety symptoms or the pediatric anxiety rating scale here, or improvement in functioning. Both groups um, seem to track well in both conditions. Um, but if you look in their brains, you see some neural signatures, again, that seem to differentiate the treatment groups, such that it's very clear that the brain can delineate side effects um, uh, and symptoms um, and can also help us understand who might be predisposed potentially to more side effects compared to um, having a more adaptive uh, treatment response. We did cheek swabs in these youth um, at eight weeks um, and to understand um, whether or not um, we could look at their pharmacogenomic profiles. And there is some also some preliminary exciting um, findings that suggest that there may be some predispositions and that maybe a, a pharmacogenomic cheek swab could be helpful for us to determine who might develop a side effect from an antidepressant based on their pharmacogenomic results. Um, I'm not sure that pharmacogenomics can be helpful yet um, to help us understand if antidepressants will be effective, but it, it, there does potentially seem to be some utility of using this tool to help us understand whether it's safe. So in the last bit, I'd like to talk very briefly about um, the current existing treatments for youth with and at risk for bipolar disorder and what we understand to be what contributes to a treatment effect. We know that some kids just naturally get better. Some kids have the specific effect of a treatment that we're trying to, again, tease out from a placebo or something else. But there's also something to be said about this, the very healing effects of talking to a, a clinician, uh, whether it's a pediatrician, a psychiatrist, a social worker, a mental health professional, um, a, a psychologist, uh, or marriage and family therapist, any number of our, our treatment team could be um, uh, contributing to a positive treatment effect. So we think about treating bipolar disorder comprehensively with these combination strategies. The current uh, landscape for approval for bipolar disorder, particularly in kids, is what I'd like to highlight here because my focus here is on earlier um, onset, um, is that we have a number of uh, evidence-based strategies available, but we still are oriented around treating the acute manifestation of bipolar disorder, mania, mixed states. We're starting to understand how to treat acute bipolar 1 depression. We don't know how to treat bipolar II depression in kids. We don't have actually any evidence um, yet um, uh, or, or randomized controlled trials that have, um, have gone through FDA approvals. And finally, we don't have a lot of um, understanding of how to help us um, uh, think about um, prevention of bipolar disorder and recurrent mood episodes. We do believe that it's important to maintain treatment, but um, like many clinicians, we often grapple with when would it be potentially safe for us to consider taking a holiday, if that's even reasonable, um, and it, whether or not it makes sense for us to um, try different kinds of strategies at different points or stages of uh, bipolar disorder. These are clearly unmet needs and unanswered questions, and these are things that we have to grapple with still with our clinician on a day-to-day -day basis. We also don't know precision-wise, um, what are we treating when we're treating um, somebody with a medication? What are the symptoms that are most responsive? And so in this post hoc analysis, I've tried to understand, for example, what lorazidone might be doing when it acutely treats bipolar one depression. Those kids present with bonafide depressive symptoms, but they also have layered on top of that some subthreshold hypomanias. So when we looked at dimensionally at their mania symptoms and their depressive symptoms, there are a number of symptoms that overlap or bridge between bipolar disorder mania symptoms and bipolar disorder depressive symptoms. Those bridge symptoms might be very important for us to prioritize in treatment. And, and lo and behold, here we found that the bridge symptoms of sleep dysregulation and irritability were highly responsive to lorazidone treatment, both in the acute phase as well as long-term. 
So this can provide some new guidance about how to understand the effects of lorazidone and help teach that to patients and families as well. There are a number of other exciting studies that are being evaluated and more granularly. We have some great data on lithium and its potential benefits over the lifespan um, uh, with the recent data suggesting that early exposure to lithium, particularly around the acute onset of bona fide mania, is extremely important. And it's also the vulnerability period when people don't want to be on medications or are on their parents' um, insurance as college students and don't want to be able to have to talk about these um, conditions um, in such a high, uh, highly stigmatized um, society. So we have some work to do to be able to integrate the very effective treatments into our armamentarium at the critical sensitive windows when they make the most impact and potentially could be disease modifying if we can study that and understand that in, in the current um, uh, treatments that we have beyond just the acute phase. The a number of other strategies that are coming about um, in the that are exciting because they're different mechanisms. They don't involve blockade of the dopamine 2 receptor, which is what we've typically relied on for um, mood stabilization. In addition to um, other um, uh, medications like lamotrigine and lithium and um, and uh, carbamazepine and valproate. Um, so now you have a, the second generation antipsychotics that um, unfortunately are associated with significant weight gain and sedation. Oftentimes for some individuals, metformin adjunctive therapies are very helpful and there's a large randomized controlled trial probably the largest in child psychiatry looking to see whether or not metformin could be a uh, useful adjunct to uh, second generation uh, antipsychotic medication um, uh, to prevent weight gain and um, uh, metabolic syndrome. In addition, there are a number of other strategies now that um, I wanted to introduce to you, including the trace amine associated receptor 1 agonists um, and the muscarinic um, modulators that are coming out that have an entirely different um, mechanism of action and as a result will have a totally different uh, side effect profile. So it's a very exciting time in um, in the understanding the brain and treating um, uh, CNS disorders um, because there are a number of very interesting novel therapeutic strategies that might be potentially of use um, to individuals who live with bipolar disorder. Nevertheless, it often takes up to a decade or more for treatments to get to kids, for example, and we have um, some serious struggles in getting evidence-based strategies out into the communities. My hope is that we can innovate um, more on better and more safe uh, treatment strategies that are not just good for the acute phase, but are important for the long-term Think about complementary treatments, rational combinations, understand why the placebo response might be strong in some situations versus others, conduct research in diverse populations, and think about things that improve or cultivate adherence for patients. What would make someone feel inclined to continue taking their medication if that has a positive impact? When do we consider using um, digital therapeutic strategies versus more in-person care and biological strategies. These are all open questions that are ripe for investigation. We have other tools like brain modulation and at Stanford we're studying the uh, potential benefits of um, accelerated um, um, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation or uh, RTMS um, and uh, doing it in a way that actually increases the dose and pace of the dose um, using brain modulation pre, uh, before and after neuroimaging to do it in a very guided fashion. This treatment called SAINT has been recently FDA approved um, and was developed at Stanford and we're looking to see if it could be of use in bipolar disorder and in potentially use populations. So we, I mentioned before digital therapeutics, we know that computerized CBT might be of value um, and may even help with depression and anxiety. We know that we can implement digital therapeutics well, but there are some people that who just need in-person in care. So how do we determine that? 
what baseline characteristics can help us understand who benefits from in-person care versus um, more care through digital um, means? What makes one particular treatment more trustworthy versus not? Kids who are in transition from childhood to adulthood are also an area of need and gap um, in terms of trying to deliver uh, services to the college population. This is a unique population that I care deeply about and have spent uh, the latter parts of these years, um, especially through the pandemic, thinking about and helping to facilitate early treatment um, and um, mood stabilization. Patients want to be well, not just for acute symptom relief, but also to be well because they want to recover and have good functioning and have satisfactory quality of life. When we do long term analyses of the trajectories of symptoms versus the trajectories of functioning in our collaboration with David Mikowitz, we've realized that these curves look very different. So it might be very valuable for us to incorporate these different patient centered outcomes in our armamentarium of treatment. So I think it's really important for us to generate more evidence to support long-term treatment with diversity and patient centricity in mind, because it's very important for us to understand not just how to treat an acute episode, but also to understand what kinds of treatments are really good for patients in the long-term. Bipolar disorder can be recognized during an acute break or change from baseline functioning. Without treatment, episodes do tend to recur and evolve and can tend to be more severe subsequently. Um, use at risk for bipolar disorder may show early signs of neurobiological dysfunction, as well as compensatory mechanisms even before any symptom onset. Effective, safe, um, and um, preventative treatments are out there, um, pharmacological and psychotherapeutic, that can prevent future mood episodes. We need to understand which combinations are more effective, which treatments are better for certain individuals to be able to personalize and to examine the long-term outcomes. And by the way, we're resilient. Knowing when to treat versus when to allow adaptive mechanisms to kick in are really important. So my sister here reminds me of that. She has Down syndrome and congenital heart disease. And she reminds me every day that there are a lot of things that you can do, even with, um, with the circumstances that you have. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge our village at Stanford um, and, and thank you for your time and attention today. I'm very much looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Singh. That was amazing. So as Dr. Singh just said, we will be fielding questions. Please type your questions into the chat. We will answer as many as we have time for today. The first question that someone asked is, why do episodes typically occur while transitioning to college? That's a great question. I think that there is a perfect storm of a number of um, issues. First of all, you've got a biological predisposition that if you look at epidemiology, it's very clear that the most common age of onset is somewhere between adolescence and young adulthood. In that range, it's very, very commonly observed. So there's something happening biologically, whether it's um, pubertal progression or or something neurodevelopmentally where more prefrontal circuits are pruned and it's like kind of like it declares itself, right? Um, I, I always joke that rental car companies got it right in terms of brain development when they said that it's not before 25 that I'm gonna allow you to use a rental car, right? Um, if we had only known that when we were thinking about when people are legal, <laughs> maybe we'd better understand what that 18 to 25 window is is still vulnerable to. So that's one aspect of it. Another aspect that contributes to this perfect storm is that you graduate from high school and you go to college and all of a sudden all of your normal usual social supports are out of whack. Uh, you've got, um, you're perhaps moving out from your childhood at home into more independence and, um, and then you have these um, these courses that you're taking uh, potentially at college that have a much higher cognitive load because they're more complicated, they're more sophisticated. So the demands of being in this situation without the usual social supports that you have to reinforce learning are gone and 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 now it 
the demand is higher. So that can also maybe be, again, contributing to that perfect storm. Socially, you know, one of the things that really um, impacts bipolar disorder acutely and early is that there's a very limited um, uh, degree of insight. It's a part of the condition. It's baked in that it's very hard to realize that your success is potentially not helpful to you, that it could actually be hurting you. Um, most people, when they experience mania, like the 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 goal directed aspect of mania the fact that you can get a lot done the more productive aspects of mania and when you see this um it's turning into something that's actually maladaptive that's potentially causing you to have days in a row of sleeping or struggling to get um, get out of a depressive episode that often follows an acute mania or the functional impairments that occur um, from um, trying to do 50 things but incompletely <laughs> so you let have a bunch of stuff left undone or realizing wow i did a lot but i don't quite remember all the things i tried to do in that um really intense period of acute mania and and then um the stigma associated with that socially that it's it's now turned to from something that's really good wow this hypomania or this really amazing uh, cognitive um uh, uh you know uh, performance that i had in high school that landed me into this really great college is now causing me to fail and flunk out of school because i can't seem to focus um, and I can't seem to get anything done um, or I can't seem to um, to to be able to get um, all of the cognitive um, uh, strategies that that helped me before working in the same ways that they did when they were maybe less intense the stigma you know is self-evident college students are on their parents insurance how many of them do you think want to ask their parents to seek to help them seek treatment for these acute manic episodes it's very often the case that people put it off um, they don't have the ability to potentially make an independent decisions because they're on their parents insurance their parents might not believe culturally that this condition can occur with, within their family or within their societies or their communities so there are a number of intersectional factors that make this particular perfect storm just ripe um, for attention. And again, one of the reasons why as an academician, I've been very focused on trying to understand how can we help this perfect storm not be so impactful for patients? That is a great answer. So for our next question, are there any other things that you recommend for bipolar one depression other than ECT and TMS? That's a great question. You know, for people who live with bipolar depression um the the armamentarium is um the the medication strategies that are out there um actually have fairly decent effect sizes and the beauty is is that there are a number of new treatments that have been recently fda approved um, to address a bipolar depression including cariprazine and lumateparone and a number of other recent um, innovations that have very different side effect profiles compared to other medications in the same class. Um, and so um, those are initial pharmacological strategies that I'm imagining this person's asking because maybe they've tried them and it's failed. But I would say that we have to give these medications potentially, in addition to psychotherapy in combination, a good college try if you will um, before you give up on them um, neuromodulation including um, um, our tms or theta based birth stimulation and ect um, down the line are our last resorts in some ways because we want to see those first line strategies um, do their do their jobs and sometimes um, even neuromodulatory strategies have basically been studied in combination with pharmacological management. So, yes, I would I would hope that perhaps some of the new pharmacological agents that are being evaluated will be evaluated um, very carefully about um, their efficacy in depression. Right now, they're being evaluated for schizophrenia. But my hope is, is that we'll be able to see a whole host of new medications Another real interesting innovation is that a lot of people are looking at um, adjunctive treatments for depression, 
that are classically used in bipolar depression because they're really great and effective antidepressants. So that's why the my lead um, into this answer was you know, around those new treatment strategies that are now recently FDA approved for bipolar depression, because it looks like their depression, antidepressive effects are are very good. Um, so, you know, taking kind of a global view of managing depression in the context of bipolar disorder, truly appreciate that bipolar depression is a tough nut to crack and that we have some more work to do to get better treatments out there. But I do think that there are some um, some very good arguments to support the current treatments that are also available. Yeah, so that's a very good answer. There definitely is some new developments going on with bipolar research that will make new waves in the future. And we only have time for one more question. And that question is, do you have any experience with views about the utility of a ketogenetic diet for young adults with bipolar disorder? Yeah, it's interesting. Ketogenic diets have become um, very um, uh, intriguing from in the research world, I think, um, because of a, a couple of centers that are really looking deeply at um, this particular uh, strategy. Historically, ketogenic diets have been used um, in the context of neurology uh, very frequently to manage um, and help prevent seizure uh, recurrence um, in individuals who live with epilepsy with some um, some um, effect. Um, and it's interesting that, again, those ketogenic diets in the context of neurology have often, again, been used adjunctively um, with medications um, and not necessarily in it of themselves or on their own. There are uh, some case uh, reports that have suggested that um, using ketogenic diets in combination with existing um, uh, strategies could be of benefit to some people. It's um, unclear yet um, who benefits from those. And, um, and nutritionally, um, I think there are a number of factors that are uh, need to be considered. Uh, is the concept when you're thinking about a ketogenic diet, the idea that maybe you could use it to uh, prevent recurrence of mood episodes, just like you do uh, to prevent recurrence of seizures. Um, is bipolar disorder kind of like a seizure? Some people experience those episodes um, in some ways like they experience a seizure. Um, and so and then there's uh, some comorbidities and overlaps in those in those individuals as well. So I think that the data are still unfolding um, to be able to make um, definitive conclusions. And the reason why is because the best way to be able to know whether or not a ketogenic diet will work is uh, in the context of a randomized controlled trial. And so um, um, those may be um, beginning to be conducted um, in, in patient populations to help us understand whether it will be of use. Uh, until the, the, the data are um, published uh, through peer review, um, I'm going to um, remain a bit skeptical in part because I know that um, that these kinds of strategies um, not only have the importance of potentially being very uh, revolutionary for some individuals, they also have the potential to poten to, 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 to have some side effects. Um, and so we have to understand what the landscape is in terms of uh, safety and tolerability of, of this kind of intervention as well. So I'm, I'm hopeful that maybe we can learn something in the coming years. And I know that there are a number of folks who are very keen to see this um, treatment uh, be successful. Um, I will uh, I will be very keen to see the uh, results of the randomized controlled trial to help understand its value. Thank you so much, Dr. Singh. Unfortunately, that's going to wrap up today's webinar. If we didn't get a chance to get to your question, please email info at ibpf.org. We will provide you with resources that will help you out. Dr. Singh, do you have any closing comments? Yeah, I would love to just um, wrap up and say I, I really appreciate our um, community efforts to understand this very complex uh, condition um, and how it manifests over the lifespan. It takes a village. And if we want to go fast, we can do our things alone. But if we really want to go far, let's go together. 
And so it's really a, a delight to be able to collaborate with the International Bipolar Foundation and other uh, community um, advocacy groups and um, folks who are really committed to to seeing us find a cure for bipolar disorder. So I'm I'm, I'm very honored to be um, a part of that community. Thank you so much, Dr. Singh. And with that, everyone have a great afternoon. Bye, everyone.